Hi there and welcome to the first in a series of virtual sessions based around analysis and review and how we can approach the game from an analytical mindset. Before we get started we should say thanks to Wendy and Kat who have been at the forefront of the development of this series and I know over the coming weeks that there's some great content online for the TRU membership and that we all as members benefit. So what we're going to get started with today is more around the analytical mindset and just how to approach the game. So I've been very lucky uh, to have been able to work in some of the best rugby environments in the world from super rugby through to international rugby and then some European Cup stuff. And what's coming in the next few weeks are observations and ideas that I have fleshed out and put together. And hopefully they can inspire you as the member to help develop and grow the game. Over the course of the next few weeks, I will detail out uh, everything based around a, a scale from if you have an unlimited budget for technology or if, if you have no technology at your available whatsoever. So the core principles are the same and how we approach the game is the same. But what, what technology we have and what we have access to will dictate just how detailed we can get. So let's get started. So when looking at the game through an analytical mindset, the first thing to consider is what is the purpose of analysis? So the purpose of analysis is to, it's an understanding of what actually happened instead of what you think happened. And the simplest way I can describe that is, I'm sure we all know this from our playing days, where we make a breakaway and you feel like, oh, I was running so quickly. And then when you see yourself on video, you're like, okay, maybe it wasn't that fast after all. So that's the purpose of analysis. It's understanding what happened instead of what you think happened. So before we get to this, we're going to talk about the core aspects of rugby. Um, there are only four core aspects, and we'll start with the first one. And the, ga the game is broken down into. The first one is the technical aspects. So the core skills of a prop are scrummaging. You know, it's your biarticular force and your biarticular lines. It's your line out lifts. It's it's the things that only the prop does. The secondary skills are hitting rocks, uh, resourcing rocks. It, they are, you know, lifting for kickoffs and, and such stuff like that. So they are the secondary skills. So when we think about the game from a technical aspect, we have to think about it as core skills and secondary skills. The second aspect is a tactical aspect, and that is the understanding of your role. Perhaps it's the understanding of a shape or a game plan. Um, we've all had those, you know, X's and O's where we've, we've drawn up the perfect game plan only for it to not work. Um, and we don't quite understand why it didn't work. Was it a skill execution? Was it a technical execution? Or was it a failure to understand the actual plan itself? The third aspect of rugby is the psychological aspect. So that's the individual, that's the arousal levels. That's the people are high arousal or low arousal. That's the common behaviors. It's the reaction to stress. It's the perceptions. For instance, if we uh, take the victimization uh, cycle or circle, and that's what, if we give away a penalty, do we perceive it to be our fault, the referee's fault, and then how do we react to that? And how we react to that can usually dictate if performance will improve or will actually deteriorate and we give away further penalties. And it's our motivations. And then the last aspect is the physical aspect. And it's the positional involvement. Like take, for instance, someone that's, five foot six and 140 pounds they're not exactly ticking the right boxes to play second row so that's they are the core aspects of rugby i hope that's simple to start with we'll take just a quick pause where you guys can think about that before we move on to the next thing so after the core aspects we are going to take a look at the unit the units within rugby and their roles and focus and i found this to be really helpful for my development and understanding of game plans and strategies and tactics because when we have a clear understanding about what the roles of the unit are 
then it's very easy to be analytical and data driven. So for instance, the type five, when you look at the type five, their job is to win possession. And that's through scrums, through lineups, through kickoffs. That's what their job is. Everything in rugby starts with a set piece. So it's up to the type five to win possession on every set piece. They lose forwards. Their roles and focus is to retain and regain possession. That's through resourcing rucks, it's through generating turnovers, it's generating knock-ons by tackle pressure or getting off the scrum, for instance. So quite simply then, the halfbacks, their role is to dis distribute possession. So they'll generally have the most touches per game, and it's the distri distribution of possession through passing, through kicking. The midfield is where the majority of tries are created. So we want them to, create, to orchestrate the line breaks, the gaps, and then creativity. And then finally, your back three players, you want them to finish with possession. Ideally, you want them scoring. So when we look at just these the units, and we break it down to these units and these very, very simple roles and the focus of each unit, the game is quite easy to understand from both a player and coach point of view. And it's quite easy to be on the same page when we're talking about what's actually needed of you as an athlete. So now we are going to combine what we've just discussed, the core aspects and then the unit roles and how to have a review process around these two things. And it's quite simple. So if we start on the left here, you have your technical, your tactical, your psychological, and your physical. And then across the top, we have our individual, our units, the forward slash backs, and then the team. And if we think about the review process through these aspects, it's, we don't have to review all of the core aspects for every element. So we'll just, we're going to just go through technical for the moment. So technical on an individual basis is crucial. It's your run catch pass skills, it's your tackle technique, it's it's your uh, ruck entry angles. It's a key component as well for our units because it's the scrum binds, it's your your lifting pods in the line out, it's your footwork, it's the movement as a unit. And then if you were to try and an analyze it from a technical point of view, the forwards and backs, you've already covered the technical elements. And there's no technical elements as a team. It's either individual or in your units. So if we compare that to the tactical aspect, individually, tactically, all you have to do is understand your role. That's the only thing you should be assessed on. As a unit, it's vital though, based around, let's say, retaining or regaining possession if we were to look at the loose forwards. If we think about them as forwards and backs in total, it's your shape. It's what we want to do and where from the set piece. So how the backs attack, what kind of, if they want to have a starter play or a strike play. And then as a team, it's your overall game plan. It's your shape. It's, it's the shape and attack and defense. Are we defending outside in? Is it a drift defense? Is it a jockey defense? Um, so there's a lot of tactical elements to the team review process. And I'll run through the other two quickly. So your psychological is your behavior and your arousal level. So, so as I said earlier, some people are high arousal levels, others are low arousal levels. The low ones we need to bring up, the high we need to bring down, we need to find that sweet spot. Uh, compare that to the team psychological aspect. It's the, the, the team dynamic and the unity. It's if we can see to try our fingers pointed, do people start blaming each other or are we helping each other? And a good team environment is very hard to beat, as we all know. And then for the physical, it's your involvement, it's your profile, and again, for your units. There's no there's no review needed as a team on the physical aspect. So that's how to think about the game, combining both the core aspects and the unit roles into a simple review process. So now we're gonna talk about what I believe to be the single most important thing to look at in the game of rugby if we're going to be successful or not and that is cohesion so what is cohesion it's very it's very definition is the action or fact of forming a united whole and how does this relate to rugby well we're going to talk about that coming up so how does this relate 
Well, there's two key aspects. There is the cohesion review process, which I find to be very beneficial for our attack and then the opposition's attack. And then there's a second aspect of a team cohesion index, which we will get into at a later date. So there are three key points to scoring. And as we know in rugby, everything starts with the set piece. So the top quality ball from the set piece is the single most important thing to start with. So if we look into some research I did around the 2015 World Cup. So take for instance France. So France won 100% of their own scrum put-ins. But 0% of that would be defined as top quality ball. At the international standard, top quality ball is defined as the ball is in and out within three seconds. The platform stays up. It's a clean presentation for the number nine. And depending on where we want to go, you either get a loose head up or a tight head up. So that's what top quality ball is defined, is defined as. If we were to compare France and New Zealand in the 2015 World Cup, France won 100% of their own put-ins, but they had 0% top quality ball. Whereas the All Blacks won 97% of their scrum put-ins, but had 89% top quality ball. So after the top quality ball, and after our set piece, what we want to be looking for is what I've called a, an explosive strike move. Did we get past the gain line, where we stopped on the gain line, or where we tackled behind the gain line? And that's a very simple way of looking at it. And where we got in relation to the gain line impacts our running lines and then the defense running lines, which, lead us to lead, which leads us to the next thing. So if we can get lightning quick ball, which we define as two and a half seconds from the point of contact until the time is passed, and if we can do that for two rucks, then generally we're going to create a line break and a scoring opportunity. Now, the time that each of us chooses to define as lightning quick ball is up to you guys, depending on the level we're at. The best example I can give of that is, if you do remember the 2015 World Cup, Australia had Michael Hooper and David Pocock in the back row, and they were completely dominant against every team they faced, except in the final against New Zealand. So New Zealand wanted to generate lightning quick ball, and how they did that from line out was they always threw to the player in front of David Pocock, which meant he had to lift in the line out. So by him lifting in the line out, he couldn't quick release. And Hooper would release from the line out and they would run at him, forcing him to make the tackle. So then the All Blacks knew they had the next two phases free where they could generate really lightning quick ball because the two best breakdown specialists in the competition were taken out of the game because Pocock was behind play because he lifted and Hooper had to make a tackle. So that's why lightning quick ball is so important. So I have just three simple examples here which we can look at for team cohesion review. And they're taken from the Austin versus Glendale MLR game. And we'll just look at the three clips and then I can and then I'll explain afterwards. So we're going to start with just three lineouts, which were roughly in the same part of the field throughout, this, throughout the game. So the first lineout, it's to the front and it's slow and it's not top quality ball, it's almost intercepted. The second one, same thing, we go to the middle, we win it. Now, is that an explosive strike move? Is he behind the gain line or in front of it? count the time of the rucks, and then the attacking options. It says another attacking platform shut down, which I think probably won a penalty. And here's his third one, top quality ball. Did he get in front of the gain line or was he tackled behind the gain line? Look at the speed of the first ruck, and our attacking options. Now compare the speed of the second ruck. So that was some examples of that. Uh, we go to the next slide and we'll look at it on paper. Sorry. So if we look at just, just the three examples on paper, so it's a quick and easy breakdown. So the first set piece was poor, is almost intercepted. The outcome was a scrum. So the next one we look at, set piece, uh, it was a top quality ball. The strike made it to the gain line, uh, if a little behind it, but then the breakdown was very slow. And the outcome was we lost 20 meters, but we gained a scrum due to a knock-on. 
And then the last one we won it, kind of in the front to the middle area, the strike move we got, we, there was a break in the gain line, but then we had a slow, slow breakdown afterwards. There was no lightning quick ball. So that's just three. That's just three that we have looked at. Now, what you do is if you can build up a series of these over the course of a game. So for example, I have just a, I went through the Sabercats versus Rooney, and these are the Sabercats set pieces and the starts. And you can just, we can start to build a pattern. So if we can do this for every game that we play, we start to develop trends and patterns, which we can get into heat maps and plotting on the pitch. But for now, it's just, it's quite simple. We, let's say, let's just take a, uh, let's just take the scrums. So a scrum on the right, 40 meters from your try line, you got top quality ball. There was no strike move. We did have lightning quick ball. There was rocks and we made a, there was a line break generated and we made it 75 meters. The next one did win it, but the scrum collapsed. There was an explosive strike move, but the lightning quick ball on the second rock was slow, and we ended up kicking the ball away. And this will make more sense when we get into the next um, the next slide. So, so that's looking at cohesion as a closed aspect or element. So again, we, we focus on the set piece, the strike move, and then the rock speed. The, the next aspect, which I think is a wonderful thing to do, is to track your rook location. And it, this is, again, it's just working around creating a more analytical mindset towards the game. So this is a, one I did from last season. And again, it's color-coded, and there's varying degrees of uh, detail that you can go into. But for now, it's you can create a, through PowerPoint, you can create almost like a plotting map on your rook's locations, what happened when turnovers were generated, when tries were generated, in situations that we kicked. And this is quite simple to send out to the players and they can understand that and they're able to see the differences in their possession. So for instance, here we had four, two passes, two pass plus phases in a row, but then we generated a slow ball. We ended up kicking the ball away. Uh, Sabercats were counter-attacked and a try was scored. Um, and again, we can just track through some of this quickly. Bang, bang, bang. Oh, I'll go back to that one because that's a good plot. And again, this is just a phase of play. So we go from 18 to 19 to 20. These are all the one-off runners. Then we put the two pass. The field is reversed. We're on the left-hand side. We're playing around that come back to the right hand side but you see what they weren't actually generating any go forward ball um, and I find this to be a really good way and really beneficial for the players because we get to understand the areas that we are playing in that the decisions we are making and the different types of plays that we are attempting and this is this is just a basic overview what you can do is when you have your teams uh, attack shape or attack moves, then you obviously you give them a different color and then we get to understand um, what smaller shapes we are calling and playing and executing in different areas of the pitch. So we'll just run through some more. And again, this is all just the Sabercats against Rooney. You can track across some more phases. So we're picking going close to the line, pick and go, so make some one-off runners and then they score in the corner. And again, by the end of the game, you get to, I think they had 90 possessions in this game, 86, 87, yeah, 90. And there was a turnover at the very end, and they ended up losing the game. So that's, that's I find that to be really beneficial for the players, and I find the players like it, so we're able to get a better understanding of what we're doing and where we are doing such a thing. And this is just ball in hand, a, an issue about team cohesion and the cohes cohesiveness of play that we could also look at is the penalty count against us. And I find this is also a very simple thing. And if you do have uh, good relationships with the referees, you're able to share this and have discussions around it. So this is just a, an old copy I pulled up from a previous job. And it's tracking uh, the penalties that we conceded in the, both the first and the second half and then their outcomes so again i put them in three categories it's like the referee has no choice but to penalize you and that's uh laying on the 
rock on the wrong side, it's an offside, it's um, silly things like slapping the ball out of your hand. Um, then the orange was the penalty won by the opposition. That's getting over the ball and then mistakes by referees. So having an idea of the penalties that we give away and what the consequences are. So we look at just the first half of this game. The first one was a quick tap, that's fine. Um, and actually one and two in this game were connectors. We gave away the quick tap, they got down to the line. Then we came in from the side, gave away another penalty and they quick tapped again and they scored. Um, so this is, I find, just a good way of, of understanding the consequences of our actions and then the different types of penalties and where we give penalties away in the field. And stuff. So that is the end of the cohesion review process and how I like to look at the game of rugby through a cohesive mindset. So we'll go into the review. So constantly thinking. So when we are looking at the game from an analytical point of view, we have to constantly think about the four core aspects. That's technical, tactical, psychological, and physical. And everything comes back to those four core aspects. But when, and then when we think about the actual game flow and the playing of the game, the key aspect to think of for the entire game is around cohesion. It's the cohesiveness of ball in hand. It's how we disrupt cohesion in defense. It's looking at the transition from the set piece to the strike move to the rock speed. It's also looking at the penalty counts, um, how the penalties impact our game, and just overall how cohesive as a team we are. So I hope that uh, was helpful and beneficial. For the next one, we are going to talk about um, game analysis through the use of uh, video recording you know so I'm gonna go into how to how to video a game how to record it what what's the best angles what's the kind of distances you want the tools that you can have uh, post recording if you're going to have analytical tools and software and how to get that out to the players so that's going to be the next one and I think that will be really beneficial to the majority of the membership. So thank you for listening, and we're going to have a Q&A session later on where I shall be answering any questions that you may have.